Welcome to the Move to Value podcast, powered by Chess Health Solutions. The Move to Value podcast is dedicated to helping healthcare providers understand and make the transition into value-based care. We do this through conversations and the sharing of innovative ideas with experts and leaders throughout the healthcare industry. Our mission is to sustainably transform the healthcare experience for the patient, provider, and care team by cultivating a value-oriented, compassionate, and health-aligned community. Today we talk with Kim Vesudi, Senior Director of Clinical Operations at Chess and Practicing Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, about the importance of advanced care planning and strategies for starting those conversations. Dr. Kim Vesudi, welcome to the Move to Value podcast. Thank you, Thomas. It's good to be here. So today I want to discuss some things that I know are of great importance to you, uh, which is advanced care planning. Um, Can you tell me or tell us what that is and what it consists of? Sure. Um, It's basically a discussion um, with patients about their plans for their future. Um, It's about what they want to do if something were to happen to them and they couldn't speak for themselves. It's about end-of-life care in a lot of ways, um, making their wishes known. Um, It's a discussion that can occur between a provider and their patient and their patient's family members or someone that they want to make decisions about their care. And it really outlines what their wishes are so that there's no guesswork, there's no stress at the end of life that the patient's wishes are known. That's fascinating. So you are a practicing physician um, and a a darn good one from what I understand. Well, thank you. Um, So how important do you deem advanced care planning uh, and the care plan for your patients? So I think it's essential. I think um, as providers, we're just not doing it enough. It's one of those things that they don't teach us about in medical school or in our training, or at least I didn't have that education. I've been out about 16 years or so. So no one ever told me how to do this. The The goal of being a doctor is to save people and to keep them alive for as long as possible. So having those discussions about end of life care feels very different um, and probably goes against what my teaching has been as a provider. So when they looked at, they they actually asked patients and people if they're having these discussions with their primary care physicians or physicians in general, and 84% of Medicare age patients said that they've never had this discussion with their doctor. And these are patients that are in the older generation, so no one's talking to them about this. And they also polled Americans um, in general, so this is not just Medicare age patients, but uh, Americans in general said, uh, 92% of them said they'd like to have these kind of conversations, that they're interested in that, that they're willing to have those conversations with their patient or with their providers and, and to discuss their wishes. 53% of that group said it would be a relief, you know, if someone would bring this up to them and that have this discussion so that they don't have to think about it or talk about it, that they can start making decisions now about their future. So in my practice, um, you know, I tend to do these discussions at well visits um, because that's when patients don't aren't thinking about anything but just being healthy. So I start saying to them, well, what, what if something were to happen? What, what are your wishes? Have you talked about this with your family? Um, and it, I think it's just as important as talking to them about diet, exercise, vaccines, cancer screening. And the, you know, one of the drawbacks though is this takes time. That's why I typically do this at the well visit, um, because it takes a lot of time to have these discussions. And I give myself about 30 minutes for those visits. So I'm able to really discuss it with patients and um, answer their questions about it. You know, for providers, there's a lot of issues because we're not trained and we don't have guidelines. No one tells us how to do this. Um, Providers, one of the things that they say they're most fearful of even having these conversations because they don't want to destroy hope for people. Uh, They don't want to tell them, oh, yeah, guess what? You know, the end is near and you better start thinking about it. They don't want to take that hope away from them that there's a chance that they could survive something. So, uh, you know, there's 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 issues there that providers find um, difficulty in talking about it. But I think it's important. I think and patients have made it clear that they think it's important as well. I remember in a a presidential election, maybe 2012, and there was a lot of talk of death panels. Yes, I remember that too. Was, and and when I started 
learning more about yeah. value-based care, it seemed like that was just part of the the Medicare benefits, right? Yeah. Is that what that was all about? I think so. Um, I think, you know, there's this, well, and we'll talk about this too as we continue on with our, you know, discussion, that there is a lot of money being spent at the end of life. That's when we spend the most money on someone with their health care. So knowing that, we look at how do we save money in healthcare that takes up this giant chunk of the total spending in this country. And I think that's where the death panel discussion came from. It's like, oh, when you're getting old and you're costing a lot of money, let's just put an end to it. That's not what this is. In fact, this is more about what are your choices? What does it look like for you at the end of life? Nobody's pulling any, you know, any tubes out of anyone or turning off any machines. That's not what this is about. But the patient is having the discussion and the choice. What does this look like? What are what, I want to take back control of that time of my life because there is an inevitable end. Like there, we're not getting out of here alive. What does that mean? How do I want that to end for myself or my family members? And it's, it's a good idea to have the discussions with your family. I think that's where the, the that's where the death panel <laughs> conversation came from. Unfortunately, it gets a little skewed. I mean, it is a little morbid to talk about money and death and what do we cost and what does that look like? But unfortunately, there's only so much to go around and we have to think about that. But we also have to take back control of what this looks like for us. So you recently wrote an article describing an encounter with a patient where you had to deliver bad news. Um, That article is available on the on our website, if anyone's interested. Can, but can you tell our listeners about that scenario you described and how, although you were delivering bad news, the patient was able to have the conversation on their own terms and your realization that patients actually want to talk about end of life? Sure. Uh, this was, and this is pretty quick story. Um, I was needing to tell a patient a CAT scan result and she had had a history of cancer, lung cancer, and it had gone away, but there was some symptoms. So we repeated the CAT scan and it showed that the cancer had returned. Well, typically I like to give those new, that news in the office, in a visit face to face. I called her myself and I said, you know, I'd like to talk to you. Can you come in? And she said, you just need to tell me now, tell me whatever it is. And I said, where are you? Cause I could hear sort of traffic noises and just the noise of being outside somewhere. And she's in the Walmart parking lot. And I said, well, are you sure? Yeah. She's like, yes, I want to know. So unfortunately, at least for me, I had it. I told her the news right there, but that's what she wanted. She, she wanted to know right now. So patients, you give them, you give them the choice. Where do you, you know, where is it comfortable for you? Sometimes they just can't stand the idea of waiting to get in the car, drive over to the clinic to hear the bad news. I will tell you though, um, an, an issue or a time when, um, I did not do this well. Like I did not do an advanced care well. Um, and it was actually pretty recent, so I should have known better. But, um, sometimes you just think that somebody else is going to do it. I had a patient who was diagnosed with cancer, had not seen the patient because they were now following up with the oncologist, but they ended up in the hospital and came in to see me for a follow-up. And when I saw him and understood what was going on, I I knew that there wasn't a lot of time left. You know, the, the medications were not working. The chemotherapy was not working. And no one had had the conversation with him yet. I know. Mm. So that was tough because that's not ideal. I want this conversation had when no one is at, you know, in the moment, like when you don't have to make these decisions facing the end of life, you want to have it early so you can really contemplate, ask questions, make decisions because he had one way of thinking and his wife had another way of thinking. They were not on the same page. Yeah. And so that, that can be hard. You know, that was a time when I don't want that kind of episode to happen again because I feel like I didn't do the right thing for the patient. The, it turns out okay. I mean, he, he was able to get the, his decisions made, but it was in a time that was a little bit more stressful than I would have liked for him. So mm. that is hard because as a primary care physician, we are the ones who should be having the conversations. Even though you assume, okay, he's been going to another doctor for this, they're not. 
they want to have it with us as primary care physicians. They want to talk to us because I know them the best. I know their life situations. I know their family members. Sometimes I know the name of their dog. These are the things that they entrust me with. And so who better to talk to them about their full life cycle than me? Um, so that was a time when I prob pr probably was not my best, but I definitely learned from that and I try to get ahead of things now. Yes, life lesson learned. Why, you know, it, it, it amazes me uh, because I'm as guilty as the, the patient in the story you described. And I feel like, you know, as a parent, we, we talk to our kids about promiscuity, the dangers of alcohol, you know, all of these things, preemptive measures that will make hopefully better decisions down the road. And we learn this at our place of employment, you know, with you know, whatever policies we have, we, there's rules that we have to follow. Why is it we, as a, as a patient, why do we struggle with this, mm -hmm. do, in, in your opinion? Do you, do you feel that there is a, a, a causation because it's the end of life, because it's just something you don't want to think about? Although every human has to think about this exactly. in some capacity. Um, I think there's a lot of factors. Uh, for instance, um, family members and their desires. So family members can have their idea of what your life should be like. There's also religious factors. What does it mean to me in a religious way? Do I survive or do I make other decisions to sort of support my life until I pass? Do I do everything possible? So patients have all of these ideas in their mind, what it looks like to pass or to have an end of life discussion. And that doesn't always come from within. Like there, it's not obvious to them that this is happening, that um, they need to make that decision now. I think all of us put it off. There's always that glimmer of hope that something will change and um, that, that factors will intercede that will create a miracle that, that this will not happen. So it's difficult. I think most people though, want to start the conversation. That's what the statistics show. Even though it seems like maybe we're not preparing, people want to start talking about it. How does a provider who may not be having these conversations start the conversation off in the best way to get the patient to talk? And some best practices that you've discovered that facilitate a successful advanced care planning process and maybe some of the questions a provider may ask the patient. The first thing to do is acknowledge if it's uncomfortable. And I think most providers probably have a little discomfort. We have to face this ourselves. Uh, I think telling the patient, I really want to have this conversation with you. It's a little bit awkward for me, but I really want to know what your wishes are if something were to happen. That's fair. And patients appreciate that vulnerability. They understand it and they feel they're feeling the same way. So they want their providers to acknowledge that. You can start to assess though, what are their desires? And it's really just a few simple questions. Um, what is your understanding of your health and your current illness? What are your most important health related goals? What does a good day look like for you? What brings value to your life? What are your fears or worries regarding your health? And what are the trade-offs you would be willing to make or not make if your condition worsened? It's really just getting it started. Of course, there are details that can be worked out, uh, but in the beginning, you just want to know where, where are they in the process? What are their thoughts about their life and their condition? And once a patient's wishes are known, how are they formalized? Well, in North Carolina, we have something called the MOST form, which is the Medical Orders for Scope of, inter, uh, for scope of Treatment. Uh, this form is great because it can be done in the office between the provider and the patient. It does not have to be formalized in any way as far as notary, and it really lays out some of the most important questions that a patient may be asked at the end of life or their family member may be asked, such as, do they want CPR? What kind of medical interventions would they like? Um, what, is, what do they want for antibiotics, fluids, or nutrition? The most form is reviewed yearly. It's reviewed at in, when a patient is admitted or discharged from a hospital, it's reviewed if the cha patient changes their mind, which can happen. Patients can change their mind over time if they 
don't want certain interventions or if they do want certain interventions. And the most form can be changed accordingly. Another thing that can be done, and this is pretty much anywhere in any state, is an advanced care directive or a living with a living will. That is more formal. It can be done with or without a lawyer. It does need to be notarized, and it does outline the what the decisions are that the surrogate would make in in the case that the patient couldn't make the decisions for themselves. So it's a little bit more legally, you know, legalese, um, but it, it's important because that is a standing document. It's a declaration of their desire for a natural death, and it allows for withholding of any sustaining life treatments or with, with parameters. So it can also say things like, I want antibiotics or I don't. Um, it's just a little bit more formal. So Dr. Vasudi, do you, do you feel like this is a, uh, a scenario where it's, it's like a diagnosis where you have the conversation, which is the treatment, and then the patient is cured? Or is this an ongoing conversation similar to how you would have a conversation about diet or wellness or exercise? What are your, what are your thoughts there? I definitely think this is not a one and done conversation. You get the conversation started and even things like the most form and advanced care directives do not have to be done that same day. This is something you want to continue over time. I often, usually about three times I've had this conversation before forms are even really introduced, to be honest with you. I want the patient to start thinking in the direction, start having the talk at home with their family member, um, answer questions the next time, and maybe potentially give them some websites to look at where they can read more about the forms and then potentially give them the form. I could also do that in, you know, sooner, but it's usually a longer conversation than one time, and I, I definitely feel that that's important. You don't want to rush this. You want everyone to weigh in and everyone's feelings to be heard and um, and meet all the expectations. Because the person that we often don't talk about, we're talking about the patient, the provider, but we are not talking about the family member who has to now know my mom or dad or family member has these wishes and I'm the one who has to carry that out. So it's important to bring them in at some point too. Um, and that may take another visit. So, and we can talk about coding eventually, but that that can all be coded for visits that you have these discussions with people. It is a it is a way to get paid to do the conversations. I don't like how that sounds though, but it is a way to um, get acknowledgement for the work that you do and it doesn't have to be done once. You can do it multiple times. I hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, but for now, Dr. Kim Vasudi, thank you for joining us today on the Move to Value podcast. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for listening to the Move to Value podcast, powered by Chess Health Solutions, where our mission is to sustainably transform the healthcare experience for the patient, provider, and care team. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. As always, you can head over to movetovaluepodcast.com to sign up for the email list, as well as check out all the resources in the show notes. If you are interested in continuing to hear about value-based care and how it impacts you, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Also, we would love it if you would share the Move to Value podcast across social media and leave a rating and review. See you next time.